Uh, okay, there's a number of topics I want to talk about today. Uh, this is our last lecture, and I want to keep some time at the end for like you know random questions on random topics that you might want to ask. You know, maybe sort of general questions in general about like approaches to machine learning, AI, deep learning, etc. Uh, you know, maybe questions related. Really, you know, kind of you know maybe that maybe a little more philosophical, but. Um, but let me start with uh, something more concrete. So um, I want to talk about structure prediction. I alluded to this topic a number of times during the previous lectures, uh, but I think not enough in depth for, uh, for most people to understand. So I want to come back to this. Um, so structure prediction is basically uh, the problem of uh, predicting a variable that itself is not just like a single category or uh, you know, a single object, but basically a sort of uh, combinatorial object. So for, for example, things like a sentence, you're doing speech recognition, you're doing uh, handwriting recognition, you're doing natural language uh, generation or translation. And what you need to output is a sort of grammatically correct, consistent sequence of, uh, of symbols. And there is no, uh, you can't say that there is a a, a finite number of possibilities of the output because the, the length of the output might be variable. Uh, but even if it's if the length is has a maximum and the number is in principle finite, uh, because it's combinatorial, um, uh, there's no way to kind of enumerate all possible different outputs. And so to express the the type of constraint that the output has to reflect, that's that's what, what's called uh, structural prediction. And this uh, you know, there's a lot of work on this going back uh, um, to basically the early days of speech recognition. So this is not a recent problem. Um, and in fact, the the I'm, I'm going to start by a little bit of history. Uh, in my mind, the the first model to uh, do uh, structural prediction combined with things like neural networks uh, trained discriminatively uh, was this speech recognition model for uh, for words by uh, Xavier Drioncourt and Leon Botou back in the early 90s, 1991. And there was kind of similar work about the same time by uh, Yosha Benjo and about a year or two later by Patrick Hafner. So these are people who worked on discriminative training for systems that were supposed to produce a sequence of symbols uh, from uh, uh, you know, a signal, let's say speech uh, or handwriting, and where once the, the first step basically is uh, a neural net. Uh, here, uh, and this, this neural net, I wrote TDNN, this means time delay neural net, it's basically a temporal convolutional net. Uh, so this is the, you know, the first model I, I, can, I, I can find of uh, uh, structure prediction uh, uh, sort of hybridized with, with neural nets, if you want. So the problem that uh, Xavier Donacourt and Leon Boutou are trying to solve was uh, recognizing words using a, a neural net. Um, and to some extent, the modern approaches are, are kind of similar to this, but uh, in, in some ways. So the speech signal is represented as a sequence of acoustic vectors. So those are, uh, you know, you, you, you slice the signal into little chunks, and then on one of the chunks, you do a, a Fourier transform, which uh, Fredo has explained to you, and you turn it into basically a feature vector. And you have one of those vectors is typically 30 dimensions or so, maybe 40. Uh, and you want one of those vectors every 10 milliseconds, so, so about 100 times per second. So you have a sequence of 40-dimensional vectors, uh, uh, about 100 per second. And you, you, you run this through a convolutional net, a temporal convolutional net. And at the output of it, uh, what you get is a sequence of feature vectors. You can think of it this way. Uh, in modern systems, those feature vectors are actually uh, uh, kind of softmax vectors that indicate a, a category. But in their case, it wasn't. Um, and those can be at the same rate or they can be slower. So if the, if the neural net has, if the convolutional net has temporal subsampling, you're not gonna get 10 of those feature vectors per second. You might get, you know, 25, uh, um, you know, two and a half or something, right? Uh, I'm sorry, at the input, there is a hundred. So if you have a subsampling by a factor of four, you will get 25 feature vectors per second, not 100 um, or something like that. Now here is the problem. The problem is you want to recognize which word was just pronounced. Um, and uh, different people will pronounce uh, the same word at different speeds. And so what you need to do is uh, what's called dynamic time warping. And I explained this uh, already in the, in the past. So let's imagine that you've recorded this person. You don't want to do uh, speaker independent speech recognition for now, just uh, speaker specific. So you've recorded that person saying uh, 
you know, let's say the, the 10 digits, uh, uh, spoken digits, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Uh, because you're only interested in recognizing uh, uh, spoken digits, isolated spoken digits. Maybe this is a system that is supposed to, uh, you know, dial a number uh, on your phone, right? So it just needs to recognize sequences of digits. Uh, or perhaps it's a very simple speech recognition system that tries to spot the, the wake-up word for, uh, you know, Amazon Alexa or something like this. So the only thing the system is supposed to recognize is Alexa or Hey Google or you know something like that, right? A wake up word. Um, so uh, the system may have a bunch of uh, pre-recorded templates that correspond to uh, sequences of feature vectors uh, that were uh, produced by uh, uh, someone speaking each, each of the words. Um, and now the, the way you want to train the system is that you'd like to uh, train the neural net at the same time as the template so that the overall system recognizes the words uh, as best as possible. This is a classification problem, um, but there is a latent variable in it. And the latent variable is how, is, how are you gonna time warp the sequence of feature vectors so that it matches the length of those templates? And again, I'm kind of repeating myself because I talked a little bit about this before. Um, so you do this with dynamic time warping. And what that consists of is that you line up uh, all the feature vectors uh, along the bottom here of this. So this is, think of this as a matrix. You line up all the feature vectors uh, at, the, uh, at the input. So that you get the, the, the sequence of feature vectors are here. And then you put the sequence of template vectors. So uh, feature vectors coming out of the template uh, on this axis. And then each uh, entry in the matrix uh, is an indication of the distance between the feature vector uh, uh, here and the feature vector there, okay? So you get this populated matrix with uh, distances between feature vectors, essentially. Um, and the best, uh, the best way to map the sequence of feature vector into another one to, to see if they fit is to basically uh, view this matrix as kind of a, a, a set of nodes in a graph. And what you want is go from the lower left-hand corner of that graph to the upper right-hand corner by going through a path that uh, minimizes the sum of the distances along the path, okay? Uh, so obviously you're gonna have to go horizontally, you know, more steps than you go vertically. So on a few occasions, you're gonna do diagonally, on a few occasions, you're gonna go vertically up, but on many occasions, you're probably gonna go horizontally uh, uh, to, the, to the right. Uh, and that would be the situation where you have multiple feature vectors here that are essentially identical that match a, a single feature vector in the template, okay? So for example, you pronounce the word seven very slowly. The uh, uh initially is gonna be you know, repeated multiple times because you, you stick on it for like a quarter of a second. So you're gonna have 25 uh, instances of this. And all of this would be mapped to maybe a single feature actor here that corresponds to this sound uh. Um, so finding this path that best warps the, the, the sequence into the template sequence um, is like minimizing with respect to related variable Z. Okay, so it's like you have an energy function and you minimize its energy function with respect to the latent variable. The latent variable is the path in that graph. Um, so now what you have is the best warping that matches the sequence of feature vector to the first template. Now you keep doing, the with, doing, the with, with, doing this with all the templates, okay? So for every template, uh, every word, you know, from zero, one, two, three, two, nine, you have the best way to warp the, the, the feature vector to that template. Um, and, uh, uh, and now you can, uh, if your system has been trained, you, you pick the, the category of the word template with the smallest distance, okay? As simple as that, that's for classification. Now, how about training? So for training, um, this is a latent variable model, essentially, and what you need to do is you need to uh, make the energy for the correct answer as small as possible, and make sure the energy for the incorrect answers are larger. Okay, so um, so let's imagine the correct answer is is oops sorry is this word here the second last one that corresponds to zero one two three the category three for example. Okay, so we know the correct answer is three. So what we need to do now is uh, basically uh, change the word template here a little bit so that it gets closer to the the feature vector sequence. 
and then change the feature vector sequence so that it gets closer to the template, right? You can think of this uh, DTW uh, distance, this dynamic time warping distance as a kind of distance uh, which involves minimization with respect to a path, but in the end is some sort of distance or divergence. Uh, and what you need to do is, and that's basically your energy. So what you need to do is make that distance smaller for the correct answer, okay? So the energy of the correct answer goes down. Uh, and simultaneously, you need to make sure the energy of all the incorrect answers get uh, are, are larger, okay? So you might need to push them away. So you might need to have an objective function that is going to uh, take the templates for the wrong words and somehow push them away from the current sequence of features, okay? So that's how you learn the templates. Um, and then simultaneously, uh, you you need to... You, you, you're going to have kind of a, a combination of, of gradients that are going to backpropagate through this DTW. One, um, one is going to try to make that uh, sequence of feature vector uh, such that once you go the time warping, it gets closer to the correct word template, but also uh, change it uh, so that it gets away from the, uh, the other templates, the, the templates for the other categories. Okay. Um, so, that is simply backpropagating through the, uh, you know, through the dynamic time warping. And the dynamic time warping really is a switch. It's a giant switch, right? It basically tells you uh, those values here on the, along the path matter because uh, they are the ones that indicate whether my input vector matches my uh, template vector, okay? All the other ones that my path is, is not taking are irrelevant, they don't matter. Um, so the distance is just the sum of those values. So when I backpropagate, I just get uh, for each vector here, a gradient that corresponds to uh, the gradient of, uh, you know, basically the the, the distance uh, to the corresponding vector in the template. Uh, so, for the correct template, this was this is going to cause all those vectors to get closer to the corresponding vector in the template, and all those vectors to move away from the corresponding vector in the bad templates that you decide to push away. And then you can just backpropagate those gradients all the way through. Now, I'm kind of uh, explaining the mechanics of it, but uh, you don't actually have to think about it. You know, in principle, kind of um, um, uh, conceptually, it's just a energy-based model with latent variable, and you just compute the gradient of your energy with respect to, uh, you know, to everything in your, in your network uh, for you know, values of latent variables that depend on, you know, the position of the of, uh, of, of this switch here. You can think of this switch as the one that tells you which of the answers is correct. Um, and so it's, it's nothing more than an energy-based model. Okay, now there's a question. Um, so why am I uh, introducing this before talking about structure prediction? Because this is a very simple uh, form of structure prediction, particularly if now the problem is not to recognize a single word, but it is to recognize a sequence of words, right? So a word is a sequence of sounds, uh, but a sentence is a sequence of words, and so therefore also a sequence of sounds, right? So I could build uh, a collection of possible sequences, which are grammatically correct sequences of words, which correspond to uh, some grammatically correct uh, sequences of sounds. Uh, and then this kind of dynamic time warping, if you want, will sort of find among all the possible uh, sequences of, uh, of symbols or, or, or sounds or words will find the one that has the lowest energy, okay? That this feature vector is closest to somehow. Um, okay, so that's the general problem of sequence labeling. And, uh, um, and it can be formulated uh, at, a, at a general level uh, in this way. Um, now, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I kind of set the stage a little bit, and now I'm going to talk about something that you're not going to see immediately is connected, but um, uh, it's going to come up at the end. Okay, so let's say you have a learning system that is uh, composed of an input X, okay? It, it, it gets an input X, and it's an energy model in which the energy is a sum of three terms in this case. So those, those, those uh, uh, blue squares here are basically factors in a, in a factor graph. They're energy terms, additive energy terms in your energy function. Uh, and your output is, uh, is a sequence, in this case, a sequence of four symbols. Uh, and those symbols um, do not all uh, contribute to all the terms in the, in the energy. So basically your energy function, the first term takes into account the first two 
uh, output uh, 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 symbols or, or variables in your in your output, in your sequence of output. The second one takes the second two. The third one takes the the, the third and fourth. Okay. Now imagine that um, this were a sequence of words, and your system was supposed to do something like speech recognition or something. So X is the speech signal. Uh, in the blue boxes, you have neural nets and various other things. There might be another neural net that looks at X, X and then produces feature vectors that go into those boxes, but uh, that's a detail for now. Um, and um, what those blue boxes would, would have to uh, implement is basically grammatical constraints. So, uh, you know, in English, certain words can follow others, but not uh, others, right? So you, you rarely have two, two verbs that follow each other. Um, and so uh, you could implement this in this uh, energy term that would make you pay a price for uh, you know, making a verb follow another verb, right? Or having, uh, I don't know, you know, two prepositions. You can have two adjectives that follow each other, you know, things like that, right? So basically those would you know, implement sort of basic grammatical rules. And you can think of this as kind of a language model, right? So I know what word came before, uh, tell me what word can, can come after, and I can train this on the corpus of text to learn this uh, energy function. Um, so, you know, it's a, it would be a very basic crude uh, language model. So this type of model would imp implement a very crude language model by just, you know, taking the previous word and then telling you what the, the next word, what next words are possible, making you pay a price for picking a word that is not, uh, not correct. Um, okay, so... Um, how you do inference? This is just a, basically a, a, an energy model here, which in this case doesn't actually have a latent variable. But uh, basically, I give you an x, and you have to find the sequence of y that minimizes the energy. But in this case, because the energy uh, is a sum of three terms, there are efficient way to find the sequence of y's that minimize the energy that may not require a completely exhaustive search or gradient descent or something like this. Okay, and I'm going to place myself in a situation where y, the y's are actually discrete. Okay, so there's things like words or, or sounds or, or categories of some kind. Um, and uh, so this applies to, uh, uh, you know, this situation where the, the variables you need to infer are all outputs, um, which means they're going to be visible on the training set and you can train your system to kind of infer them cor correctly. But it could also be another situation where uh, you know, some of the variables are observed like X here on the left uh, and Y is observed during training uh, on the right. But then all the intermediate variables are never observed. There are latent variables that you need to, you need to minimize over um, as well. But again, here, this factor graph is, is factorized in the sense that the energy is a sum of, of different terms that only take subsets of the variables into account. All right, okay, so let's say, uh, let's take a very concrete example now. And uh, let's say the uh, uh, energy here in this case is a sum of four terms, four energy terms, okay? Uh, the first two uh, depend on X, the observation. The last one depend, uh, the last two depend on Y, which is the, the variable you need to predict, which you're given during training, but not during test. And then two other nodes are, are latent variable nodes, okay? And let's say, uh, uh, X is some high dimensional variable. We don't care what it is because we just observe it. And uh, Z1 is binary, Z2 is binary, Y1 is binary, and Y2 is ternary. So it can take three values, zero, one, two, okay? Now, uh, if you count how many possible configurations of Z1, Z2, Y1, Y2 there are, there are basically uh, 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 24, right? Uh, two times two times two times three, right? That's, that's 24 uh, different possible configurations of values. So if you wanted to do exact inference, uh, you might have to try all 24 of those configurations and then compute the energy of all 24 of those configurations and then pick the one with the lowest energy to do inference, right? Um, and in fact, those, uh, those 24 uh, configurations correspond to uh, 24 times three evaluations of those uh, energy terms, right? Because you have three energy terms. So you will have to compute 96 different energies to be able to do this, okay? And this is a small example where the sequence is short and the, the, the variables are binary, okay? Uh, this goes exponentially with the number of, with the length of the sequence. Uh, and uh, 
uh, uh, um, sorry, with the, the number of, of um, uh, possible values of the of the of the z's uh, and the, the length of the sequence. So if you have, you know, uh, uh, you know, n possibilities for each of the variables and the length is l, you know, it's n to the l, right? So it's exponential in the length. Um, okay, but the thing is, there is a more efficient way of figuring out what is the um, uh, configuration of lowest energy. And it's due to the fact that you have those kind of local, uh, this local structure, right? So uh, uh, Z1 can only take two values, okay? And Z2 can only, also only take two values. So this energy term here can only take four values. It's ever going to see only four different uh, values because it can only see 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, right? So you could imagine pre-computing those four values, okay? This guy is also gonna see only four values, right? So you can, you can because this is binary and that binary, that's binary. So you can pre-compute those four values, okay? So that's another four evaluation of an objective function that we're, we're up to eight. And this guy has six different values because this variable is binary, this one ternary, so it's two, by, two times three. So now you have six different configurations. So by pre-computing the four here, the four here, and the six here, uh, uh, you you have computed all the possible uh, uh, configurations, basically. Um, and that's going to represent it here at the bottom. So this is called a trellis, and it's basically a graph that has a source node and a target node, and every path in a graph corresponds to a particular uh, assignment of, of the variables. Okay, so for example, if I go through this path, okay, it means y1 equals, uh, z1 equals one, z2 equals zero, y1 equals one, and y2 equals two, let's say, okay? And if I add up the, the terms on each arc, I get the overall energy. Each arc is, is uh, uh, basically annotated by the uh, energy term, the value of the energy that corresponds to this configuration. So for example, this arc here uh, is this energy and that's the value of this energy term for y1 equals one and y2 equals two, okay? Uh, so each of these arcs is a value of uh, this energy term. Each of these arcs is a value of that energy term, um, etc. And now the Finding the, the best lowest energy configuration of Z1, Z2, Y1, Y2 simply consists in finding the shortest path in this graph, okay? And to do this, I only have to evaluate uh, four, four terms of energy here, four terms here, and six terms here, and that's it. Okay, so that's uh, 14. I don't know why I said 16 here. Oh, 16 because of the first two here. Yes, so it's 16 values total. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> so that's a lot less than 96, okay? And that's because the, the energy is a sum of terms and you can use those kind of efficient algorithms uh, to do the inference. Okay, so this is a simple case where the output is a sequence. And when the output is a sequence, there is a simple algorithm uh, and it's basically shortest path in the graph, right? In a, in a trellis. So that's just dynamic programming. Uh, um, and it's very simple, it's efficient, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's nice. So to train a system like this, what you need to tell it is you need to tell it, here is the correct configuration of Y1, Y2. I don't know what Z1, Z2 is because it's a latent variable. So find me the path that goes to the correct uh, combination of y1, y2, okay? So you know that, let's say y1 equal one and y2 equal two. So you know that the correct path has to include this uh, link, right? And so there's only a, a, a subset of, of paths for the, the previous ones that are possible, right? You can't go to y1 equals zero because that's, that would be incorrect. Uh, so basically only this, this guy survives and then the other paths, you can take whatever you want as long as it gets to that point. So you can just find the one that minimizes the energy here. So minimize the energy with respect to Z1, Z2 so that uh, Y1, Y2 take the right value. Uh, 
Okay, because training where when where are you to take the, the the right value, and the way you train the system now is that you by gradient descent you back you back propagate the gradient of the overall energy, okay, for this particular y and this particular x, and the z that you obtain by minimizing, you back propagate uh, the 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 gradient of of this energy with respect to the parameters of all those energy terms, and you try to make that smaller, right? You know you have the correct y, the correct x. And whatever z value uh, uh, z must take, try to make that energy lower by tweaking the parameters. At the same time, uh, you have to make sure the energy of incorrect answers for y1 and y2 that are incorrect is higher, right? So you take other values of y1, y2, uh, including y1 equals zero and y2 equals whatever it wants, okay? And for all of those other configurations of y1, y2, you want to make sure whatever energy you, you get by minimizing over Z is higher than whatever you got for the correct one, okay? So your loss function is going to be something where you take the energy of the correct answer, you try to make it lower, and then you take the energies of incorrect answers and you try to make them larger, okay? That's discriminative uh, training for structure prediction. Structure prediction, because the structure here is uh, represented by this... Uh, uh, you know, sequence of, uh, of costs, okay? But conceptually, at a high level, it's no different from everything we talked about before when we have a latent variable and when we train with a criterion that says, I want to make the energy of the correct answer small and the energy of uh, all the other answers higher, okay? Any question at this point? Um, I had a question. So based on this diagram, it seems like this um, this network only really takes discrete values. Um, and my understanding was that back propagation doesn't, isn't really effective if you just have only working with discrete values. So I'm wondering if I'm missing something or if that's like how, how you connect those things. Right, okay, so uh, in this case, Z1, Z2, Y1, Y2 are not variables that, that you learn Okay, they're labels essentially. Okay, they're, they're discrete. So one, 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 two are discrete, just like uh, you know the the class, the category at the output of a component is discrete. Except you have two of them, but whatever. Z one, Z two are basically of the same nature. They're discrete variables. They're not things you can learn by gradient descent. They're just latent variable you you have to to minimize over to do inference. Right. Let's not talk about learning for now. Uh -huh. Once your system is trained, right? I give you an X. And by energy minimization, you find Z1, Z2, Y1, Y2 that minimizes that energy, okay? And because you've trained the correct Y1, Y2 uh, to have the lowest energy among all possible configurations of Y1, Y2, you're gonna get the correct one, okay? Now, uh, for training, the, the, the training takes place, uh, you know, uh, basically affects the parameters of each of those factors. Inside those factors, there are parameters, you know, W A, W B, W C, W D, which I, I didn't represent here. And the way you train the system is you you say, you know, at the gradient of the energy of the correct answer, uh, with respect to those parameters, I'm going to tweak the parameters so that energy goes down. And that's continuous, um, differentiable. Okay, and then simultaneously you have the energy of bad answers. I'm going to back propagate gradients, and uh, according to my loss function, I'm going to push up the energy of those. Uh, so that my energy, my loss function goes down. Okay, my training objective goes down, not my energy. Right uh, now, so so now the what I'm explaining here down there with the trellis is the fact that because those variables are discrete, you can't use gradient descent to uh, infer them. Okay, and so you have to infer them by uh, combinatorial search essentially, uh, and the first uh, solution I, I mentioned with the 96 factor evaluations uh, basically is exhaustive search, right? Try every combination of Z1, Z2, Y1, Y2 and, and figure out which one has the lowest energy. But, uh, but the whole point of this is that this is wasteful in the sense that because the energy decomposes into terms that only take subsets of variables, you can actually decompose this into, uh, you can reduce this to finding the shortest path in a graph where the transitions in this graph are, are, are annotated by the energies that correspond to the value of the variables uh, of the two corresponding nodes. 
Okay. Now, this is a slightly more general form of what I told you about earlier. Uh, so this, this model here with the dynamic time wrapping uh, is very much the same, right? You, you, you know, the Z1, Z2 here are basically the paths in the dynamic time wrapping uh, uh, module. The Y is which of the word template uh, matches, okay? And the training consists in just, you know, doing gradient descent to make the energy of the correct answer small and the energy of the incorrect answer is larger using some loss function, which I leave, I leave unspecified at the moment. Professor, when you say that you're finding the, the, shortest, um, the shortest path, you're saying that the, the distance between nodes is the energy between the nodes? Uh, the, the shortest path is the path that has the smallest uh, sum of terms along, along, the, along the edges, right? So each edge here is marked by an energy. So for example, this edge here is marked by the energy of uh, the term uh, uh, B uh, when Z1 equals zero and Z2 equals one, okay? Okay, and yeah. So if I take this path, I'm gonna pay that energy, right? And right. if I take this, this uh, edge, I'm gonna pay that energy. And so, you know, finding the lowest energy configuration of variables consists in finding the path with the, the, the smallest sum of uh, value along, uh, on the edges along that path, okay? So it's the shortest path in the graph, okay? Is that clear? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. And then, right. so the the zeros before the the black node, the, those are zeros just because the the summation itself is zero energy, right? Is that is that? Yeah, what that's is? right. Yeah, okay. I'm not I'm not counting. Uh, yeah, like I don't care which of those paths it is, right? Uh, I don't have an energy term here for, uh, like, what's the value of y two? So if I had an extra factor here that only took y two, then uh, that factor would basically put an energy here on the, you know, we replace those zeros, right? Okay. There is a question here coming from the students. So we are pushing down on the energy or we are actually doing a minimization for training and inference, but then when are we actually pushing up just okay. during training? All right, so let, let me remind you how uh, training energy-based models work, right? Uh, particularly contrastive methods. Uh, and if you have latent variables, right? So you have your, you have your energy function, E of X, Y, Z. Uh, sorry, the arguments are in the wrong order here. It doesn't matter. So you have your energy function, E of X, Y, Z. I give you, I give you an X. So in, in training mode, I give you an X and a Y. I don't give you Z ever, but I give you an X and a Y. Here is a training sample. It's an X and a Y. The first thing you do is you find a Z that minimizes the, uh, the energy E of X, Y, Z, okay? And you call that F of X, Y, right? But the way you compute it is just min over Z of E of X, Y, Z. Now, uh, for, for the, the correct Y in your training set, you want that energy to be small, right? And for your inference algorithm to work at test time, at test time, I don't give you the Y, I just give you the X. And what you have to find is the Y that has the smallest energy. So for this to work, it has to be the case that the correct Y has the lowest energy among all possible Ys, right? So what I need to do now during training is that I give you the correct Y and what you need to do is give a low energy to the correct Y and give a higher energy to every other possible configuration of Y, right? Uh, and exactly how you do this or how all those energies enter in your objective function uh, depends on the objectives that you choose. We're gonna to come to this in a minute, okay? But almost certainly you're gonna have one term in your loss function that's gonna say, make the energy of the correct answer uh, low. And another term that, that's gonna say, make the energy of all the other answers or some of them high. And we talked about this last time, actually three weeks ago. Okay, but I'm gonna come back to it. Right. Is that clear or do you need another clarification? Uh, I don't see any reply here. Okay. All right. Um, 
Another one would be, what if the factor graph is not possible? Uh, do we have to search for all possible combination of Ys? Maybe I think this is the continuous yes. case, I think. No, not necessarily. Oh, no. So, uh, I mean, this, this idea of decomposing into uh, energies also gives you an advantage, even in the case of continuous variables, right? Because you can do independent optimizations, right? Like the combination of uh, values of Z1 and Z2 uh, only affects EV, you know, even if Z1 and Z2 are continuous. And so you can do kind of the, a little bit of the equivalent of uh, dynamic programming there. It's a little more complicated in the continuous case, but, uh, but it could be uh, uh, possible. Yeah, I mean, the, the worst situation is when uh, all the Zs and the Ys enter a, a giant factor and there is no way of uh, factorizing it. And then, you know, you have to do exhaustive search or some approximate... Uh, uh, search heuristics, okay? Inference algorithm that minimizes the energy. Yeah, yeah, that was actually the case uh, the student was referring at. And yeah. the other student is also satisfied. So you answer okay. both questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, don't hesitate to ask if you if there's something that's not clear. Uh, okay, so uh, here is a, an instance of this. Uh, and if you encounter this in uh, the literature, you'll know what it is. It's called a conditional random field. Okay, so conditional random field is a very special type of such uh, structure prediction model uh, where, uh, you know, the, here you have Ys or Zs, doesn't matter. Um, here there are only Ys. But the, the way those factors are parameterized is that there is a fixed feature extractor. It's called F of X, Y1, Y2 in this case here. Uh, and then a weight vector that just computes the dot product of this feature vector uh, with, with this weight vector, and that gives you a score here, uh, just a, an energy, okay? The overall energy is just a sum of all those terms. So basically, those are shallow neural nets, if you want, single layer neural nets with a, a feature extractor at the input. Um, and then we can think about like what type of uh, loss function are we going to minimize to train something like this? So uh, one possibility is to use the negative log likelihood loss. So basically, you say, I want uh, the energy of the correct answer to be low. And I want the log of the sum of the exponentials of all the energies of all the bad, the, all the answers, including the good one, uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be large, okay? Uh, in fact, more, more, more correctly, you want the minus log of the sum over all configurations of your outputs of the exponential minus the energy of all those configurations to be as small as possible. Okay. Um, so, um, so basically you want the, the combination of energies of bad answers to be as large as possible. Okay. And we've encountered that loss function before, right? I mean, that's basically what's used in softmax. Softmax says that. Softmax says, uh, I want the, the, you know, negative log probability of the correct answer to be as low as possible, the probability of the correct answer to be as large as possible. That's like an energy, uh, okay? Uh, but then simultaneously, I compute the, the sum of the exponential, the log of the sum of the exponentials of all the answers, okay? And I want that to be, uh, to be small. I want all those energies to be, uh, to be large. I want all those probabilities to be small, okay? Softmax does that to you. We, or log softmax criterion, where you backpropagate, it, it does classification and it does exactly that. It pushes down the energy of the correct answer. It pushes up the energies of all the other answers by computing the log of the sum of all the answers of exponential minus the energies. Um, so here, uh, conditional random field is basically an example of that, but you're not doing classification, you're doing kind of structure prediction. And uh, in the positive case, you have the correct uh, uh, configuration of y1, y2, y4, y1, y2, y3, y4. And the incorrect ones are not, you know, uh, incorrect categories as in, um, uh, as in classification, but there are incorrect configurations of y1, y2, y3, y4. Uh, other than that, it's just, you know, backprop. I mean, it's not even backprop here because it's a shallow network. If you put a, a whole neural net in there parameterized by Ws, that would be perfectly kosher, and uh, that would be kind of a, a deep conditional random field, if you want, which happened to actually exist before conditional random fields. Uh, here's another idea, you can use a hinge loss. So the hinge loss says, 
Um, I want the energy of the correct answer to be low. And then among all possible configurations of incorrect answers, incorrect configurations of Ys, I'm going to look for the one that has the lowest energy among all the, wrong, all the bad ones. And that one I'm going to push up. Okay, I don't need to push the other ones because they are larger anyway. Um, so I'm just going to you know, figure out which configuration of Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4 is both incorrect, but among all incorrect configurations has the lowest energy. I'm going to push that up. Okay, and the way I push up and push down is I'm going to put the difference of those two energies in a hinge loss so that uh, the hinge will push the energy of the correct answer to be low and will push the energy of the incorrect, most offending answer to be higher by at least some margin. Okay, um, so that's called a maximum margin uh, Markov net. If you regularize the weights uh, with least square and if you have this kind of linear parameterization of the energy terms. Uh, you can also use the perception loss and uh, Michael Collins, uh, who's a well-known professor at Columbia in NLP, actually, you know, kind of made his success, you know, built his career around this idea of using perception loss for structural prediction. So that perception loss only works if you have a linear parameterization of the factors. If you make them deep neural nets, you can't use the perception loss anymore. And it's because the margin is zero. And we talked about this a little bit before, but I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, Right. So, uh, so those ideas have been around for a long time. The, probably the first people to, to think about things like this were people who worked on what's called uh, uh, discriminative training for speech recognition. And that goes back to the late 80s, early 90s. So Yoye and Rabina, for example, at at and had something they called uh, minimum empirical error loss. And this is kind of a particular loss for a speech recognition system. Did, they didn't have neural nets. They had some other way of kind of uh, turning uh, speech signals into, you know, basically sound categories, if you want. Um, but but they had this way of training at the sequence level uh, by not telling the system, you know, here is this sound at that location, that sound at that location, but just telling it, uh, here is uh, an input uh, sentence, here is the transcription of it in terms of words, you know, figure it out by doing this time warping, um, you know, in the context of hidden Markov models, which is kind of very similar to, to the, the dynamic time warping I was talking you, uh, talking about earlier. Um, then as, as I said, in the early 90s, uh, people started working on uh, using neural nets to kind of feed uh, one of those kind of uh, structural prediction system. Um, uh, as I said, the first one I know about is by Xavier de Yoncourt and Yombo Tu for speech recognition, but they had a, a time delay neural net. Uh, Yosho Benjo did his PhD on this um, and, and had some results around 1992 and Patrick Kafner the, the year after that. Um, uh, Leon Botul, Yosha Benjur, and Patrick Hafner are the co-authors of uh, uh, my paper from 1998 uh, about handwriting recognition because uh, I hired all three of them at at and uh, uh, to work on this problem. They had figured, basically figured out you know, some way of doing this in their PhD thesis, and I, I knew that was the, the trick uh, that needed to be worked on for things like handwriting recognition structural prediction with neural nets. Um, right, uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, so um, so here is a way, um, and I only alluded to this really quickly in an earlier lecture, here's a way to sort of put this in the context of uh, uh, deep learning. So as I said before, one way to, to do this in the context of deep learning is uh, you make those factors deep neural nets, basically, right? They just compute some energy and they are parameterized by a bunch of parameters and nothing changes. Uh, you, you know, we know how to do backprop and we have PyTorch. Um, but here is uh, uh, here's a slightly different idea and this, um, which kind of draws on the same type of, uh, of, of model. And this is when uh, the, the, the structure is more complex than just, you know, a bunch of fixed factors from uh, known, um, uh, uh, with a known structure, if you want. And so the example I'm gonna use here is, uh, is, is handwriting recognition, but um, uh, you know, because there's a long history of it and I have uh, uh, you know, drawings that are, that are prepared for this <laughs> that have been around for a long time. But, okay, so, um, so here the problem we have is that, you know, we have a sequence of uh, digits at the input and we don't know how to 
uh, segment this digit into individual, uh, this, this sequence into individual digits, because we don't know what the parts are for each of the digits. The four here is kind of broken into two parts. Uh, and so what we can do is uh, build a graph in which each path is a possible way of breaking up this sequence of uh, blobs into, into characters, right? So I can group, you know, I can make each of the separate pieces a separate character. So that's the path at the top. I can group the first two pieces, three, four, and the left part of the four, and then have the last two be separate. Or I can have the first, uh, the first um, uh, be by itself, the, the following two be regrouped, and then the last one be by itself, right? So what have I done here? I've basically uh, uh, said, okay, the way I do, I did inference in the, in the context of structure prediction was by having uh, uh, energy terms that tell me the, 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 the cost of a particular combination of, of variables, right? So this, this graph here represents, basically, is an explicit representation of that energy model. Uh, as long as I put on those arcs here the uh, energies that uh, are computed by those by those modules for each each value, but what if I just manipulate this this graph? So what if uh, you know the state that I manipulate in a neural net uh, is not a, a particular assignment of variable together with uh, something to compute energies, but it's directly a graph like this. Okay, so a graph like this basically you can think of as representing a list of energies for every possible configurations of the of the variables of interest. Okay, it's a compact way of representing uh, a list of energies for all configurations of the sequences of symbols. Um, so, what if I, I build a, a neural net so that the internal states of that neural net are basically those uh, those graphs? And the graphs are just, again, I repeat, a compact way of representing a list of energies for every possible configurations of the variable of interest. Nothing more, okay? Um, so, uh, but I can use it for other things at energies. So here, a path in a graph corresponds to a particular way of breaking up this uh, blobs of ink into, into characters and each path is a particular way of grouping those uh, blobs into, into characters. I can run those uh, images. So now the, this graph is annotated by images, not by energies, okay? Uh, I can run those images through a convnet. The convnet is gonna tell, tell me, for each uh, arcs in this graph, is gonna tell me, well, this is very likely to be a three, and here is the energy for that three. Okay, low energy if it's a good three, high energy if it's a bad three. Um, it could also tell me, well, this may be a two, but uh, with a higher energy, or it could be a zero with a higher energy, okay? So it's gonna build this graph, which you can, uh, um, which you can call the uh, interpretation graph. Each path in this graph is a possible labeling of each path in this graph. And the labels, you know, indicate the categories uh, and the energies attached to the, to the arcs uh, are basically the energies of the, you know, produced by my convnet here for each of those answers, okay? So uh, this convnet is gonna look at this uh, little piece of a four, and it's gonna tell me, well, that looks kinda like a two with a low energy, or that may look like a piece of a four with a higher energy, okay? Uh, the guy that looks at this piece, which, you know, it's somewhere here, is gonna tell me, well, this is a four, I'm quite sure of it, uh, with low energy, and, you know, it's gonna tell me maybe it's something else with higher energy. So. Each of those arcs here is gonna be replaced by 10 arcs. I only represented two here, but uh, essentially 10 arcs corresponding to the 10 possible categories, each of them with a, a different energy that is just the output of the corresponding output of the, of the comp net that I applied here. Now inference again is finding the shortest path in this graph. So, uh, you know, finding the path with the minimum energy basically, right? So finding the shortest path. So it's basically, you can think of it as a module that selects uh, that you know, selects the shortest path. In fact, it's this one here. I call the Viterbi transformer. So the word, the word transformer in the context of neural nets was used in 1997, but uh, it's been you know kind of <laughs> recycled for something else now. Um, um, 
Right. Okay, so here's a concrete example of how this might work. Uh, uh, so again, we have uh, an input um, uh, an input image. We run this through this kind of segmenter that proposes uh, multiple alternative segmentations, which are ways to group those blob of inks together. Each path in, the, in this graph corresponds to one particular way of grouping the, the blobs of ink. We run each of those through a neural net, um, identical copies of the same conv net that just is trained to do character recognition, okay? Um, each of those conv nets produces um, a list of 10 scores. So it tells, you know, this guy tells me this is one with energy 0.1, this is four with energy 2.4, etc. This guy tells me, well, this piece is four with energy 0.6 or nine with energy 1.2 or whatever, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Uh, this guy is going to give me kind of relatively high energy for everything because that doesn't look good. Same for this guy. Okay, so now I get a graph here. And think of it as kind of a, a weird form of tensor, right? It's a sparse tensor, really, okay? It's something that says, uh, it's a tensor that, you know, for each possible configuration of this variable tells me the, the cost of that, of that variable. So it's not really, it's more like a distribution over tensors, if you want, okay? Uh, or log distribution, it's not normalized because we're talking about energies. Um, Okay, then I take this, this graph and I, uh, I want to compute the energy of the correct answer because I you know, might, might want to train the system, right? So I, I'm telling it the correct answer is three, four. Select within those paths, the one that actually says three, four. Okay, and there's two of them. There's three, four with energy uh, 0.1 plus 0.6. And then there is three, four with energy 3.4 plus 2.4, which is much higher, right? So I get those two paths, and then among those two paths, I, I pick the best one, uh, three, four, okay? So I told the system, here is the correct answer, give me the path that has the lowest energy, but yet gives me the correct answer, okay? So finding that path is like minimizing over a latent variable, where the latent variable is which path you pick, right? Conceptually, it's an energy model where the latent variable is a path. A uh, professor? Yes. Uh Three or four in the graph should be labeled before training, or that that's latent variable to figure out for the system. Uh, so here, um, I'm putting myself in a situation where I'm going to train the system supervised. I know the correct answer. This is the desired answer. Think of this as a target. Okay. Uh, so we just know the target, but don't know which part is three and which part is four. Well, that's right. So we know what the target is. We don't know which path has the correct uh, is the correct segmentation. Right. It could be. It could be this path or it could be that path. Uh, right? And, and here, what we do is we just pick the, the one with the lowest energy, which happened to be the correct one here. Okay, so. Yeah. Yes. Is this recognition transformer, is each of these, like, um, you know, NN box, are each, are those all shared? Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, this, this is multiple copies of the same neural net, right? It's just a character recognition neural net in this case. Um, okay, now you have, we have the energy of the correct answer. It's 0.7. It's the sum of 0.1 and 0.6, okay? And what we need to do now is backpropagate gradient through this entire structure so that we can change the weights of that neural net in such a way that this energy goes down, okay? And this looks daunting, but it's entirely possible because this entire system here is built out of uh, elements that we already know about. That's just a regular neural net. And those path selectors and V2B transformers are basically switches that pick, uh, you know, a particular edge or not, right? So it's like a switch. It's like max pooling, it's, except it's min pooling, if you want, okay? Um, right, so how do I backpropagate? Well, this 0.7 is just the sum of this 0.1 and this 0.6. So uh, if I have, uh, if I compute the gradient of this, with respect to this point one, it's, it's just one. The gradient of, of this output with respect to this value here, point six, is also one, okay? Because that is just the sum of those two things. And just backpropagating one through a, plot, through a sum, and that is just, that's just a Y connection. Okay, now backpropagating to the Viterbi transformer, this guy just selected one path among two. So what it's gonna do is that it's gonna take those, those gradients here and just copy them on the corresponding edge on the input graph 
and then set the gradients for the other path that was not selected to zero. It's exactly what's happening in you know, max pooling or mean pooling. You're propagating through the switch at that right position, but not propagating next to it. So it's nothing fancy, okay? Um, path selector is the same. It's, uh, it's just a, a system that selects the path that uh, produced the correct answer. And so um, I'm, I'm just gonna set, you know, whatever, uh, you know, through this, I'm gonna propagate the plus one to the, the arcs uh, that appear here. So this arc is that one. You see a zero here, but I'm coming back to this in a minute. It should be a one for now. And plus one here, and that corresponds to this plus one here. Okay, and then you can propagate those gradients all the way to the neural net and adjust the weights so that this energy goes down. Okay, so that will take care of making the energy of the correct answer small. Okay, by back propagating through this thing. Now, what's important about this is that this structure here is dynamic in the sense that if I give you a new input, the number of instances of this neural net will change with the number of segments. The graph here will change. Uh, those graphs will change completely. And so I need to be able to backpropagate through this kind of dynamical structure, if you want. And this is, you know, situations where things like PyTorch are really important because you want to be able to handle those, you know, kind of dynamical structures that change with every sample. Okay, so this backpropagation phase takes care of uh, making the energy of the correct answer small. Now, how do we make the energy of incorrect answers large? Well, uh, there's going to be a second phase where we're just gonna, in this case, we're just gonna let the system pick whatever answer it wants, okay? Um, and um, this is kind of a simplified form of uh, discriminative training for structure prediction uh, that use, uses a, a, a form of the perceptron loss, if you want. Um, okay, so I'm, the first few stages are exactly identical to what I talked about earlier. Uh, but here, the Viterbi transformer just picks the best path among all the paths. You don't constrain it to pick the, the, uh, the correct one. You just let it pick whatever it wants, okay? So it's going to pick the best path that it thinks that, that has the lowest energy that it thinks is the, you know, gives the correct answer. Now, the energy you get out of this necessarily is going to be smaller or equal to the one you got previously. Because this one is the smallest of all the possible configurations. The other ones is not the smallest of all possible ones. It's only the smallest of the correct ones. And so this guy necessarily is going to get smaller. So we don't pick the one. Sorry, I, I lost you. Do we yeah. pick the one? Do we take out the one that are actually producing the correct sequence or not? Okay, so you have two forms of it. Uh, the form I'm explaining here, you're not taking out the correct one. Okay. Uh -huh. In fact, in this particular example, it wouldn't make any difference. But uh, if you want the system to work properly, what you, what you should do here is have a pass selector that takes out the correct answers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. Okay. Um, so you would want to tell the system, give me your best shot at a wrong answer, okay? The lowest energy, wrong answer, right? Exactly. The white bar in your paper, right? That would be the white bar. Yeah. Uh, here, I'm not doing this. I'm just asking it, what's your best shot? You know, I don't care if it's correct or incorrect. All right. Uh, we'll come back to this in a minute. Okay, uh, putting this all together, my loss function is gonna be the difference between the energy I get for the correct answer minus the energy I get for whatever answer the system wants to produce, okay? So I compute the difference between those two and that's my loss function. Now I can back propagate through this entire thing. I told you I was back propagating just to make the energy here small. I'm not actually doing this. I'm computing a loss function here, which in this case is just the difference between this and that. And, uh, and I'm back propagating gradient through this entire structure, right? So whatever path appears only on the left will get a plus one. So this guy gets a plus one because this edge only appears on this side. And so it gets a plus one. The path that only appear on the right side, like this guy, uh, sorry, like this guy, get a minus one. Okay, the gradient here gets a minus one because uh, you have a minus sign here. So the gradients, you know, when they back propagate, they end up being minus ones. Okay, this guy also gets minus one. This guy here appear on, appears on both sides. And so the, the minus one and the plus one cancel. And this guy is, you know, gets zero gradient. It's, it's in the correct path, but it's also in the path that the system produces. So you shouldn't change anything. It's, it's okay, right? So the guys that have a minus one are the incorrect paths the other paths that are in the incorrect answer, but not in the correct answer. The one that I have a plus one are the, the edges that are in the correct 
uh, answer, but not in the incorrect one. Okay, the one that has zero are in neither or they are in both, right? So now you get gradients here. You, those gradients are gradients for all the outputs of all those neural nets. You backpropagate to the neural nets and compute and update the weights. Okay, and what, if you do this, then the system will eventually minimize its loss function, which is the difference between the energy of the correct answer and the energy of the best answer, whatever it is. That loss function is the perceptron loss. And we talked about this before. Um, in fact, let me go to this just now. Okay. Right, so the, the loss function we just talked about is the second, oops, the second one in this list here. Uh, this is the energy of the correct answer minus the energy of whatever answer you, your system wants to produce, okay? That's the perceptron loss, or the generalized perceptron loss, if you want. Um, and the bad news about this loss function is that it doesn't have a margin. So it doesn't ensure that the energy of the incorrect answers is larger, strictly larger than the energy of the good answer. Uh, you know, it might just collapse. It might just uh, make every energy zero or the same. Okay, uh, so it's not a good loss function to use. It just happens to work when your energy is linearly parameterizing W, but in the general case, it doesn't work. So you're much better off using something like this, a hinge, but in the case of a hinge, what you need to have here is this Y bar, which is the energy of the most offending incorrect answer. Uh, so basically uh, in the second phase, as uh, Alfredo was uh, pointing out, instead of picking the path with the lowest energy, the answer with the lowest energy, you constrain the system to pick a wrong answer. And then among all of those, pick the one with the lowest energy. And then you take the difference between those two energies, so energy of correct answer, energy of most offending incorrect answer, compute the difference between them and uh, plug this into a hinge so that you want this energy to be lower than that energy by at least M. Okay, uh, and this is the kind of objective here that uh, Driancourt and Botou used. Um, so it's, you know, it looks very similar. Um, uh, this is uh, some, something called NCE that people in uh, uh, speech recognition produce. So it's basically like, this looks a bit like a sigmoid. So basically it's a sigmoid function. You take the difference between the energy of the correct answer and the energy of incorrect answers and you plug them into a sigmoid, right? It's one over one plus exponential minus blah, blah. And so it basically wants to make that difference, uh, you know, kind of small, but then it doesn't care if it's, if it's too small. Uh, and if it's too large, it kind of gives up. Uh, and then you have, you know, this is the negative low likelihood loss. So make the energy of the correct answer small, and then make, make the log of the sum over all answers of e to the minus the energy of those answers large. Okay, we make the minus log large, which means make, make the log small, which means makes those energies large. Okay. And then the Yoye Rabiner thing I was telling you about is another form of uh, objective function that sort of put, you know, pushes down and push up. Most of those are derived from sort of probabilistic principles, but many of them aren't. Okay, all the ones at the top aren't. Hey, Professor, I had a question about the margin of the losses. Uh -huh. um, I think in a previous lecture, we discussed how the negative log likelihood loss converges to the perceptron loss when beta's uh, going towards infinity. Correct. Or something like that. But how come the, not, the NNL loss has a positive margin and the perceptron loss doesn't? Well, just, you know, because the, uh, because the, the, the temperature is, I mean, the, the, the 1 over beta, I mean, because beta is not, is not infinite, because 1 over beta is not zero. So, yeah, I mean, if you take the limit of this for beta goes to infinity, uh, this one over beta log sum uh, converges to min over y of uh, energy of w, y, x, i. And so that's exactly what the perceptron does, okay? So the perceptron is a zero temperature limit or infinite beta limit of negative low likelihood, indeed. But the margin is essentially infinite in this case, whereas the margin here is zero, okay? So there's a bit of a discontinuity here. Uh, admittedly though, if you make beta very large here numerically, uh, the energies of anything but the lowest energy term, uh, I mean, the, the, the role of the importance of the terms uh, for various y's in this sum will kind of diminish 
And so numerically, it may actually uh, start behaving very much like the perceptron uh, early on. Um, there's a problem with it also, which I mentioned before, which is that uh, this, uh, this wants to make the energy of incorrect answers infinite. And you know, it's not gonna make them infinite because as they get larger and larger, uh, you know, the, the, the gradient of this sum with respect to each of them gets very small, but they're gonna get pushed to infinity. And so it's, it's not necessarily a good thing. The hinge is better in a way because, you know, it just says, well, I just want it to be larger, you know, by, by, by some value, I don't care how much. Um, I give you another form of the, the, the hinge loss in the past uh, where you have a, a sum over Y. So in, instead of just taking the most of any incorrect answer in the hinge, uh, you take all answers and you sum over all of them, and for each of them, you have a different margin, which depends on the on the yi and the yi bar. Um, that's a more general form. It might be more expensive, depending on how you compute it. There are a bunch of questions here. Yep. Uh, so first, um, there are a few students asking about the segmenter. Do we learn the segmenter? Is he also, do we backprop there? Is he a latent variable or something? Uh, in this particular case, no. It's just, uh, it's just, um, and handcrafted heuristics. Uh, but you could imagine uh, building a differentiable segmenter and then backpropagating all the way through it, yes. This was actually one of the original plans when we built this thing in the mid 90s. We never got to it. Um, but, and the reason we never got to it is because there is an another approach to character recognition, which is the kind of sliding window approach, which I explained, right? So you just take the input, you never segment it. You just apply the neural net to every location on the input and you record the output. And then you do structure prediction on top of that. So now you have to have some sort of sequence models that tells you, uh, you know, if I observe, uh, you know, three, 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 blank, blank, two, four, 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 it's actually three, four. The blank and the two basically are spurious, right? So you, you would have uh, a grammar uh, that would indicate like what are, you know, correct combinations of, of characters on the output. And you would do this to, uh, finding the shortest path in the graph. Um, so the, the graph on the bottom uh, is generated by the seg segmenter, is it? Correct, yeah. The one with the one hop, like two hops, or two hops, one hop, one hop. Yep. Okay. And so there you, is could, a, yeah. you could think of this as kind of a simple form of graph neural net, or, or a kind of a specific form of graph neural nets where uh, the this entire deep learning architecture manipulates uh, graphs instead of tensors as it's kind of way of representing inputs, okay, or, or states. Mm -hmm. So think of this as a multi-layer architecture where the states are graphs, are annotated graphs, all right? And then you can have modules here that turns graph into other graphs. We used to call these graph transformers. In fact, that's, this is called a graph transformer network, right? Okay. Um, uh, so this is from 1997, right? This is not recent. Um, and uh, in fact, 1996, but the first paper is in 1997. Uh, and uh, uh, and then those can be, you know, as long as the way you compute those scores uh, is with differentiable functions that are parameterized, you can backpropagate gradient through this entire thing. And I kind of demonstrated how you do this in this particular case. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, then there is another question, which I'm, I may not be able to understand, which is what are the dimensions of, of the interpretation graphs? I don't know what dimensions. Uh, uh, dimension. So basically each uh, arc Okay, you, you can view it in two ways. The way I've represented it here is that each arc has a label, uh, three here for this particular edge, and an energy, 3.4. And then the number in parentheses is the gradient that comes from the top, okay? So here is a scalar, but here uh, on the graph at the bottom, the annotation is an entire tensor, it's an image, okay? So I don't specify what uh, what you can annotate the graphs with, as long as whatever it is that you annotate it with, if it's computed by some continuous functions, you, you want to be able to propagate gradient through it. Now, another way of representing this graph is not by having a separate arc here for each category, but by having a vector. And the vector just contains uh, the list of categories together with a list of scores. Okay, so zero through nine. 
and then the list of energies for each of the thing. And that would be just one arc, but it would be annotated by this factor. Yeah, yeah I see, I see, okay. Okay. Uh, but because, uh, you know, this guy, the Viterbi and the path selector selects individual paths, it's clearer if you kind of write it this way. How you implement it is up to you. Um, so those graph transformer networks, um, there are speech recognition systems today that, uh, so basically in a speech recognition system, this whole way of inferring the correct sequence uh, using, for example, a language model is called a decoder. Okay, so a decoder uh, at the output of a neural net, generally you have a sequence of vectors that indicate the, the score, the energy, the probability, whatever you want, of individual sounds or phonemes or sometimes words. And then you have to pass this to a language model that tells you, you know, this sequence is possible, that other sequence isn't, and then it picks out the best possible interpretation according to the language model and according to the scores produced by your system. That's called a decoder, okay? And the big question is, uh, how do you backpropagate gradient to the decoder? Is only a very small number of speech recognition systems today that actually do this. Uh, the latest one I think is by Ronan Colbert, uh, the original author of Torch. Um, and here is how this works. Uh, so let's say you want to, uh, so this is a, a, a particular concept called graph composition or, or graph transducers. And, uh, um, which kind of explains how you can combine graphs with each other, for example, uh, together with a, a language model, okay? So you can think of a language model um, as, as a graph. You can represent it as a graph or as a neural net. It doesn't matter, but I'm gonna, represent, I'm gonna represent it as a graph, right? So here, this is basically a lexicon that is represented, represented as a tree, tree, T-R-I-E, okay? Uh, and it can represent the words barn, but, Cute, uh, cure, cap, cat, and card, okay? So each terminal node is a word, and each path, and, and each terminal node corresponds to a path, and each path is, is a word, basically, right? The sequence of symbols are, um, is a word. Now, so let's imagine our entire lexicon is, is this, and we have a neural net or something that produces uh, uh, a trellis of possible interpretation that corresponds to this graph. So it says the first character, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I think it's C with energy 0.4, or it's O with energy one, or it's D with energy 1.8, okay? Let's say it's a character recognizer. And the second one says it's X with energy 0.1, or A with 0.2, or U with 0.8, and the last one, P with 0.2, T with 0.8. So what we need to do now is, what is the best uh, interpretation uh, of this? the best path in this that also happens to be present in our lexicon, okay? And the operation you need to do for this is a concept that was invented by Fernando Pereira, who is head of the NLP uh, research group and more than that actually at Google Research, but that was back when he was at at and uh, Bell Labs uh, in the early 90s. Um, and it was uh, sort of implemented in an open source library called the FSM library, which was implemented by Maria Mori, who is a professor at NYU. Um, he did this while he was at at and and then at Google. Um, and the, the way you do this is this composition operation. So you, you start from the initial node of both of those graphs and you say, is there, a path, is there a path I can take in this graph that is legal here? Okay, so here I can have B or C and here I can have C, O or D. Only C is common between the two. Okay, so I'm gonna combine those two by saying in my output graph, I'm gonna have one of those transitions, which is the, the only transition that is common here and here. Okay, so now I'm in this node, oops, sorry. I'm in this node here, I'm in that node there. Here I can, I can take X, A or U, and here I can take U or A. Okay, so I have two possibilities, U or A, A with 0.2, U with 0.8. And so I add those two here. Okay, so basically what I'm doing here is, uh, Whenever I come at a node and I have to take a transition, I find you know, which of the nodes that can be in here. I look at the possible transitions and if the transition exists, if there is one that matches, I create a outgoing, uh, outgoing arc and I annotate it by the energy of whatever arc I had here. If I also had an energy in this arc, I could just add those two terms or combine them in some way, okay? Um, so now I have two nodes here. Um, and 
the last one can be P or T. So I can start from those two nodes and have either P or T. And it can be in either in this node or this node. So I can go here with T, or I can go here with P or here with T. And I end up with this, those three things. So now I have my interpretation is either cat or cap or cut. These are the three interpretations that are grammatically correct and at the same time are present as a possibility produced by my neural net. And now I just have to find the shortest path there. And that's my answer. Okay? So that operation here is called graph composition. Um, and it basically allows you to basically combine two graphs, essentially, or combine two knowledge bases that are conceptually graphs, but they could be represented by neural nets. So here I can represent this thing, this whole language model by a neural net. Uh, when I'm at a particular location, it means, you know, when I'm here, it means I, I observed the sequence CU, and then I can run CU in my, in my language model and ask my neural net to predict, so what's the next letter? And my neural net will say, well, it's either T or R, uh, you know, in its softmax output with the 26 letters, it's gonna tell me, you know, T and R have high probabilities, the other ones have low probabilities. Or if it produces energy, it's gonna say T and R have low energies, the other ones have uh, higher energies. Okay, so it doesn't matter how you actually represent this. If it's represented as a neural net, then uh, implicitly, then you can train this neural net, you can train the language model, because you can backpropagate gradient through this entire thing. Okay, that, so that would be sort of an example of what people call uh, differentiable programming. I mean, basically the way to implement this is a really, really complicated program. What you need to do is backpropagate gradient through this entire program. And this program has loops and ifs and recursions, okay? So not trivial. Uh, I'm not telling you how we actually implemented this in 1994, 1995, but, uh, but that's basically how our, our check reading system back in those days was, uh, was implemented. So the loss function we used uh, in the end to train the system was actually the negative log likelihood loss function. Um, so negative log likelihood says um, uh, you have an interpretation graph here where each path is a possible interpretation and the sum of the energies along a path is the energy of that interpretation. Uh, you give it the correct answer, you select the paths that have the correct interpretation. Okay, same on the other side. So here you combine with the grammar. So the grammar restricts the, number, the, 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 the sequences to those that are syntactically correct. Okay, so if it's an amount on the check, for example, you know, it's got a decimal dot, uh, it might have you know, a, a dollar sign in front, it might have stars, you know, um, there's a grammar for it. Uh, which you can build by hand, it's a finite state uh, grammar. Uh, you, comp you compose those two graphs and you get the set of paths in this graph that actually contain a grammatically correct interpretation. And now you don't do Viterbi, you do forward. Okay, what is forward? So Viterbi computes the path in a graph that has a minimum energy. Basically it, it minimizes with respect to the latent variable where the latent variable is the path in the graph forward computes the log of the sum of the exponentials of minus the energies of all the paths, okay? So basically it marginalizes over the latent variable, which is the path in the graph. Now, it turns out that you can do this very easily and it's very cheap. It doesn't cost more than doing Viterbi uh, and, uh, and you can back propagate through it. Um, and I don't have a slide for this, so I'm gonna switch to uh, drawing it, okay, so all right. So you have one path, you have another path, and maybe another path that skips over here. Okay, and each of those guys has uh, an energy, right? E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, E6, let's say, okay? So if you do Viterbi, shortest path in a graph, you're just gonna find the path that has the minimum energy. But what I'm gonna talk about here is computing, uh, so think of the path as a latent variable Z, and remember to compute F, uh, of x, y, you can do two things. You can do min over z of e of x, y, z, 
And remember, z is the path. Or if you want to marginalize, you do minus one over beta log sum over all z's of e to the minus beta e of x, y, z. And that's marginalizing. It's a discrete sum if z is a discrete variable, which is the case here because it's a, it's a discrete path. Okay? So this is f beta of x, y, and you can think of this as f infinity, right? This is the limit for beta goes to infinity of the one at the bottom. Professor, is yes. the infinity function some simple loss function or, uh, or neural network to be trained in the model? I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Can you repeat? Uh, is the energy function here some simple, fu some simple function like loss function or some, 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 some neural networks to be trained in the model? It doesn't matter, okay? This is the, this is the energy that you use to measure the score of, a, of an answer y, okay? The observation is x. Yeah. The uh, answer you are supposed to predict, in this case, a, se a sequence of uh, symbols uh, is y. Um, and so for, you know, each of those things here is annotated with a particular y, okay? So oh, this yeah. could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, e each of those uh, arcs is annotated by a symbol. Um, so let's say uh, A, and this is B, and this is B and C, and this is, I don't know, X, and this is G or something, right? Uh, so here, the possible interpretation for y, uh, so y would be a string of symbols, and it can be either a, b, or it can be uh, b, c, g, or it can be uh, uh, c, g. Okay, if this is c. Okay, those are the That's only... That's an x. It was an x, right? E, c, huh? x. Uh, e, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're right. This is, this is a six. It's x. <laughs> Thanks. You're right. Sorry about that. Okay, those are the only three possible interpretations uh, in, that, in that graph that can come out of that graph. Um, and Z is which path you're taking, okay? So if Z is the first path, then the output would be AB. If Z is the second path, the output would be BCG, et cetera, okay? Okay, thank you. Right, but this is not used for training. This is the energy function, okay, used for inference. Um, Okay, so this, the, this, the log of the sum of the exponentials of the energies uh, for all the paths, the sum of, uh, over all the paths, okay? So the sum here is over a path. Okay? Uh, that's like marginalizing over Z. And we saw that before, right? We explained that before. Um, now, how do I compute this? Um, now, it turns out it's very simple. Um, it's done using what's called a forward algorithm. I'm actually gonna draw a different uh, tree, uh, a different uh, graph, a graph that's gonna look more like the one I had before, uh, which was kind of like this, right? Okay, so Y is a sequence of, uh, three symbols in this case, and uh, each, um, and the first symbol can be, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm using nodes here instead of, uh, instead of arcs, that's a little confusing. Uh, let me correct that. Okay, so each path in this graph is a possible interpretation, okay? So for each, uh, each edge I'm taking, I'm emitting a symbol uh, and uh, I don't have skipping connections. So here they all have uh, exactly four symbols coming out um, uh, because every path is of length four, okay? Uh, but how do I compute this sum? Uh, this, this sum, uh, basically, I go at a node, okay, when I'm at, at a node here, let's, let's take this node right, right here, I'm gonna call it red. Okay, the, the cost from the input node, the, the energy from the input node to that node is the log of the sum of the exponentials of the energies from 
along all paths to go from the input node to that node, okay? So, and of course, you know, I have, I have an energy right here, which is just the energy of that branch. I have an energy here, which is just the energy of that branch. Okay, I have an F here. Um, and to compute the, uh, the F for this guy, I just compute the log of the sum of the exponentials of those two guys. Okay, right. So let me unwrap this, okay? I've got an energy here, Y1. I've got an energy here, Y2. I've got one here, Y3, uh, E3, sorry. And one here, uh, this guy is E4. All right? The F I'm gonna get here. Uh, okay, so this is, I'm gonna call this, uh, uh, um, and I'm gonna call it anything. Um, so the value I should have here is, um, is E1 plus uh, E3. Um, exponential of that minus beta that plus exponential minus beta E2 plus E4 and I take minus one over beta log of this. Okay. So how is the E1 calculated? I mean the smaller E1. So well, so this, whatever comes out of your energy, right? Um, each of those graphs, you know, as I said, you, you represent uh, possible interpretations as a graph. Each node in the graph has an energy and a complete energy of the function, which is an F of XY for a particular Y and a particular Z uh, following a path is, uh, is, is, uh, is E of XYZ. And now what you want to compute is log of sum of E to the minus E of XYZ uh, which is a marginalization over all the paths. So it's basically combining the cost of all the paths in kind of a soft minimum way, right? Uh, but the algorithm is, is super simple because uh, you maintain a variable, basically for each node, for each node you compute uh, a variable alpha uh, for a particular node, and it's gonna be uh, equal to uh, minus log sum over all the nodes that are uh, uh, up from, from, so let's say it's node i, up from i, okay? So all the parent nodes of, of i, and then you do e to the minus beta, the alpha uh, k. And, and you add to it uh, e, of uh, Ki, which would be the energy of the link coming from node K to node I. Okay, that's called a forward algorithm. And if you've heard about this, it's actually a special case of the so-called belief propagation algorithm. So belief propagation is uh, a general algorithm for uh, graphical models. And uh, the forward algorithm is a special case when the, your graph is basically a chain graph. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm not gonna go into this. You can take a, a course on Bayesian nets or, or graphical models or probabilistic methods. If you take a course you know, with Rajesh, he will explain that to you. Um, the, this would take us um, too far. But that, that would be kind of the, uh, the thing. Okay, so now this is just a feed forward neural net where basically where the function at each node uh, is a log of sum of exponentials plus addition of, of some, some term, right? This is a neural net where alpha i is the activation and uh, of, of the, the neurons, if you want, the nodes. And the weights are those uh, 
uh, E of uh, Ki that link unit K to unit I, okay? And the operations you do is log some exponentials. So instead of a neural net in which you do a product by a weight and then you sum the products, here you add the weights and then you do a log sum exponential. Algebraically, it's actually equivalent. This is like weighted sum in the log domain. Okay, but the point is you can do this forward prop, this forward algorithm, and you can back propagate gradient. So whatever F you get at the end, you know, by the time you've run through this network, at the end here, you basically get F uh, of XY, the value of that node, the alpha here is F of XY, and you've eliminated uh, Z by doing this log of sum of exponentials over all paths. Right now, if you want to compute the the gradient of f, f of x y with respect to each of the e k i, which themselves probably are outputs of some neural net, you can do that. You can back propagate to this network. Okay, it's a it's a neural net whose again whose structure is dynamic. It you know it changes from example to example, uh, but you can you can clearly back propagate gradient to it, and that's basically what what we do here. Uh, in this system, we, uh, we run the forward algorithm on this graph and we get a score, which is the log of the sum of the exponentials of the minus the energies for all the paths, okay? We do the same here, we get another score. I mean, it's minus log of the sum of the exponentials of the energy of minus the energy, okay? Uh, this guy necessarily is larger than this one. You compute the difference and that's the negative log likelihood loss. It's the difference between the log sum x of energy over the latent variable of the correct answer and log sum x over the latent variable of every answer. Uh, although here, these are grammatical answers, but it's the same. And then you just backpropagate gradient through this entire thing. And that involves backpropagating gradient through this uh, graph here, which you can think of as some sort of weird neural net with where well, the node operation is this log sum exponentials. Uh, and you get gradients for each of the e's and each of the e's are the values that you get here, which are produced by a neural net. And so you get, you get gradients with respect to the parameters of the neural net. Okay, so that's structural prediction for you. Uh, there's a couple more topics I wanted to talk about today and variational methods in Bayesian inference, because we talked about it in the context of VAE, but without really explaining what it was, or at least I didn't, maybe you did. Um, Alfredo, uh, but like in the general form of variational inference, or I can talk about the Lagrangian formulation of backprop. I can actually do both because it's kind of fast. It will take more than five minutes, but you can leave whenever you want. Okay, then let's go for both. Uh, the Lagrange thing is short, so I'm, I'm going to do that first. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So you can formulate backprop as a minimization under constraint. So you have an input variable x is going through a first uh, functional module, uh, let's call it F1 of uh, X W1, and it produces, uh, we're gonna call it Z1. Actually, let me call this F0, F0. Okay, and then the second one is gonna be F1 of Z1 W1, and that produces Z2, etc. And so, uh, and then at the end, we have the last module, and it goes into some sort of uh, uh, energy term. Okay, with let's say desired output if we do supervised running, but it doesn't matter, it's just a cost. Uh, let's call this guy Z uh, N, okay. Z, N, and Y. Um, okay, so the, the, the forward pass can be written as Z, K. Uh, plus one is equal to F, K of Z, K, W, K. Okay, that's just a forward pass. And then you have a cost function C, which you want to minimize, which is Z of uh, C of uh, 
Zn y. Okay, that's just whatever cost function you want to minimize. Um, now, you can write the, you can write the the entire back prob problem as a minimization of the constraint. So, and the and the statement is minimize c uh, with the constraint such that. The above constraint is verified. Okay. And it, we, when you have a minimization problem under constraint, the best thing to do is to write a Lagrangian, right? So you write a Lagrange function. I'm not going to tell you right away what it is function of. Um, and for a single training sample xy, is going to be the, the cost zn y. Okay. Um, well, the other thing we might we might say also is there is another constraint which is that uh, z zero equals x plus sum over layers. Okay, so we're going to have an index k uh, from one to n and a Lagrange multiplier and a constraint which should be equal to zero, and that constraint is going to be zk plus one minus fk of uh, zk wk. And I need to, I'm gonna call this lambda k plus one and this is gonna have to be up to n minus one. And probably starting at zero actually. Okay, so this is a Lagrangian formulation of uh, my backprop problem where basically you have an overall cost function and I have a bunch of constraints. So the constraints are, are that the input to layer K is the output of layer K minus one. Okay. So this Lagrangian is a function of X, Y, all the lambdas, the lambda Ks, all the Zs and W, all the Ws, okay. Um, so what I need to do now to do this uh, minimization under constraint is I need to do dl over d lambda k equals zero. Okay, and if I, this condition, uh, the, the gradient of l with respect to lambda k is just the, it's just this, right? I mean, lambda k plus one, I'm sorry. It's just this parenthesis, okay? So I just get, zk plus one equal fk of zk wk, which is just the forward propagation formula. If I do dl over d zk equals zero, uh, it's a little more complicated, right? So I get a first term, which is uh, lambda k because I'm going to have a ZK here, and that ZK is going to be a, a factor of this lambda, a lambda K here, right? So I, I get, uh, I get, I, I guess I get lambda K transpose. Um, and then I get minus, and then for this ZK, I have a lambda K plus one here, uh, times the Jacobian function of this with respect to Z, okay? So it's going to be something like DFK, of ZKW over ZK. Uh, that's it. Times, uh, ooh, uh, okay. Times lambda K plus one transpose. And that should be equal to zero. So I'm going to rearrange all that stuff. And what I get is uh, lambda k equals dfk zkw with respect to zk. So that's the Jacobian matrix uh, of f transpose times lambda k plus one. And funnily enough, this is actually the backpropagation formula. Right. This is the thing that gives you the gradients at at level k, given the gradients I've 
level k plus one, you multiply by the Jacobian of of the of the box that you propagated through. Okay, so you don't have to think about it. You know, you just kind of write backprop as a constraint optimization problem, and backprop naturally comes out of it. Now, the first people to figure this out were people in control theory. In fact, the first people to figure this out were, were people like Lagrange or, or, or Euler or people like Hamilton and Jacobi. Uh, that's the classical formulation of, uh, of, of mechanics, if you want. Um, and in mechanics, when you write uh, something like this, you say, uh, where C of Z and uh, Y would be uh, uh, the energy of the system, like a potential energy or something like this. And then the other term was basically implements the dynamic constraints. The fact that you have a differential equation that tells you that the state at time t plus one is a function of the state at time t with some constraint, right? So that's the dynamic constraint. And then if you do this, uh, you, you, know, you, you figure out that uh, the, if you have an energy for every, uh, you know, think of k now as a time step, uh, and the forward propagation as a differential equation that uh, governs a system. And then you could have uh, a term here that is not just an energy term at the output, but basically an energy term that uh, uh, you can have one of those terms for every time step, right? So the uh, Lagrangian function would be sum over time steps of C for that time step of uh, zk, okay, and there might be some external variable, uh, let's call it yk, you know, plus uh, those constraints. k plus y minus fk of zk wk. Okay, and the, the sum takes place over all things. Um, when you look at uh, you know Lagrangian formulation of classical mechanics, that's basically the way they are expressed. Um, C is the energy, and the second term are the constraints. Now, in classical mechanics, uh, the the lambda variable is actually the momentum. So Z is the position variables, and lambda becomes the momentum. So the second term becomes basically the the uh, kinetic energy or the negative kinetic energy more, more specifically. Um, anyway, this is just a, an aparte. Okay, why am I telling you this? It's because conceptually, the, you know, the mathematics of this is super simple. If you know Lagrangian uh, uh, minimization of the constraint. Uh, and uh, this is something you can use also in a new class of model called neural ODE. So neural ordinary differential equation. And this is something Alfredo wanted me to talk about. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so neural ODE. So this is a type of neural net, which is basically a recurrent neural net where you say my state at time T plus delta T is equal to my state at time T plus delta T times uh, you know, some function, uh, which is a constant function of uh, ZT and a bunch of parameters, which are fixed, okay? They're not, they don't vary with, with time. Uh, I can write it this way, or I can write it in a differential equation form where I can say DZ over DT at time T is equal to F of ZT W, okay? So that's a differential equation, ordinary differential equation. Uh, in this case of first order, well, it depends what, what's in Z, but um, if I, you know, I could, I could, I can express just about anything this way. Uh, and the question is how do you train something like this? And basically, uh, if you write the Lagrangian formulation of this, it's trivial. The uh, so there are two ways you, you might want to train something like this. You might want to train the system to map one point, you know, z at time zero to a particular point z at time 
big T after some trajectory, you may not want to constrain the trajectory, you just, just want it to reach that point. And you don't care what it does afterwards, uh, you just want it to reach that point. And so you can have a cost function, which is basically you know, the distance of Z to that target point, uh, Z of big T, you know, I'm, I'm gonna call it Y. And then, so the target would be, uh, the target would be a point Y, and then your cost function would be the distance between Z, T and Y or something like that, okay? Another thing you might want to do is you might want to train the system so that it has stable states at particular points Y, okay? So that uh, for a particular point Y that you decide from your training set, uh, F of this particular Y, W equals zero, which means, you know, that state is going to be stable, right? The, the trajectory, so you would have a point Y in your space. And then, you know, you might start from some point and when you arrive at that point, the, the dynamics uh, stop, stops. So if you formulate this in terms of uh, uh, Lagrangian, it becomes like super simple in the sense that the gradients now, uh, contrary to back prop through time. So if you were to unfold this network here, consider this a recurrent net and you unfold it in time to compute the gradient of the endpoint with respect to the parameters, you, you kind of have to, and with respect to the initial point, you have to backpropagate through time, right? You have to kind of remember the entire sequence and then do backprop through time. Okay, but if what you're interested in is just learning a stable state like this, then you don't need to store the trajectory. You, uh, you start from some point, you converge to uh, some other point and you want to make Y a stable state. Um, <clears throat> what you just need to do is ensure that this is true. Uh, and the way you can do this is, uh, you know, basically by minimizing your cost, which would be some, so, something like the norm, the square norm of uh, F of YW. But the point, of, the, the point is that you don't need to remember the entire trajectory. The gradient with respect to the weights uh, can be obtained by running a very similar type of differential equation backwards in time. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to go into details of that. I can refer you to a paper. Um, so this is a neural ODE paper, which doesn't really mention that, but there is uh, an earlier paper of mine called uh, uh, a theoretical Uh, framework for backpropagation. And basically it explains this uh, uh, Lagrangian formulation, as well as how you apply it for recurrent nets uh, that might be sort of, you know, continuous and continuous in time and that you want to train to go to particular fixed points. Uh, this is a paper from 1988. It's not recent. Uh, you'll find it on my webpage. Down, down the bottom of the publication page. Uh, but I don't, I don't wanna go into the details of this. And there is the Bay Bayesian stuff. Bayesian stuff, yes. <laughs> People are still here, I don't know. Oh, they are you enjoying it. Stick around, you don't have to, if you don't want to. <laughs> uh, it's not the Bayesian stuff, it's more the variational. Oh, oh sorry, yeah, you're right, I, I got confused. Uh, So let's say I have some uh, loss function, okay? And I'm gonna talk about a loss now, not an energy, but it's the same thing. And my loss function uh, is a marginalized loss function over a latent variable, right? So remember, you know, I, I, I talked about this uh, before. If you have an, an energy function, uh, uh, f of x, y, let's say, and you want to derive it from a more elementary energy function E of X, Y, Z by doing the equivalent operation of marginalizing over uh, uh, Zs. And yeah, so the way you, uh, you marginalize, right, is you, uh, you do um, uh, minus beta E to the minus, you sum over all Zs and you take minus 
1 over beta log, okay? So this is a, the formula for marginalizing a latent variable. Um, and that also applies to uh, loss functions. You know, whatever function you want to marginalize over a latent variable, that's what you compute. Uh, so let's say you have uh, a model with a latent variable and you don't know what the value of the latent variable uh, is and you want to compute what is my loss, uh, which would be the log of the sum of the exponentials of the loss over all values of the latent variable. So, right, so I'm kind of marginalizing over this latent variable. Let's say it's a, you know, rational autoencoder or something. I have a latent variable in the middle and I want to compute the um, minus one over beta log sum over all values of my latent variable of e to the minus beta uh, L. I'm using L, but I could use just any symbol here. This is whatever function you need to compute. Uh, but it's useful for things you want to minimize like energies or, uh, or, or objectives. Okay, so here, um, this loss function here is no longer a function of z, it's only a function of x and y. Um, I can rewrite this as the following, q of z e to the minus beta l of xyz over q of z, right? I've just multiplied and divided by q of z. Okay, I've done nothing. Now, q of z here, uh, I assume is a, a probability distribution over z. So it's a, a density function that integrates to one when I integrate over z. So you can interpret this integral as the expected value with respect to that distribution of uh, e to the minus beta l of x, y, z divided by q of z. Okay, now here's the trick. There's something called Jensen's inequality. And Jensen's inequality says something very uh, interesting. It says, um, let's imagine I have a convex function, like say minus log, okay? I'm not drawing minus log here very well, but it looks a, a bit like minus log. Now, if I, uh, if I take um, a bunch of uh, values over a range, okay, and I compute the average of the value of the function minus log over that range, Okay, because the function is convex, I'm gonna get a value that is smaller than the function applied to the average. Okay, so my diagram is not that great because the, the curvature is not high enough. Let me draw it again. So here's a convex function. I'm gonna vary a variable here over a range. Okay, and I compute the average of that function over that range. So it's gonna you know, give me some, some value, um, you know, probably around here. And then I'm gonna take the average of all those values in this range, the average of the range, the midpoint of that range, and pass it through the, to the function, okay? Um, <clears throat> uh, and I get, I get something below this. Oh, I didn't draw this properly. So if I take the average of this plus this, you know, this, 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 and this, I'm gonna get something that's higher than that because, because the function is non-convex, it is convex. If the function was straight, then the uh, average after going to the function would be the same as before going to the function, right? If I computed the average of all those values uh, or the y values of those points, uh, I would be at the same place as the function applied to the average, okay? So you can make the intercept between the, the convex function and a line, right? That goes from those two extrema. That's right. Yeah, there you go. So that, that the, the mean would be the, yeah, that point, yeah. That's right. So the, 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 the mean applied to the 
function values would be something like this chord. It wouldn't be that, but it would be kind of close to that. Okay. Now, it, let's forget about a, a function like let, Actually, I should have explained this uh, in a very simpler way with just two values. Um, let's say it's just a sum of two terms. Okay, so I have a convex function. I have two values. Uh, the average of those two values after I pass to the function, okay? So basically, let's say this is, uh, my function is minus log. Um, so the average of minus log of, uh, let's call it x1 and x2, minus log of x1 plus minus log of x2 divided by two, okay, is this point, okay? And then uh, minus log of x1 plus x2 divided by two is that point, and that's below, okay? And Jensen's inequality basically says if you have a convex function, like, like minus log, uh, the, okay, and then here I computed an average, but you know, it's true for any expectation. It says the um, expectation, um, so basically, uh, you know, convex of expectation over any distribution of some function h, uh, well, that would be z in that case, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I have to write this in the proper way, is less than or equal to sum over z, qz of this convex function applied to h of z. Okay, that's just sense inequality. Uh, so this, this works with um, uh, minus log, which means I can write that my objective function here is less than uh, minus one over beta, which I'm gonna uh, actually put inside. Uh, I take this back. Uh, is going to be less than sum over z of q of z times minus one over beta log e to the minus beta l of x, y, z divided by q of z. Okay. But you see the the one over beta, the minus one over beta log exponential minus beta cancel, okay? So what I get is sum over z, q of z, L of x, y, z. So that's just the expected value of L averaged over the distribution q of z. And then I get a second term And the second term is the negative uh, log, one over beta, the negative log of, uh, of Q of Z, but there is, you know, Q of Z is a denominator. So I'm gonna bring it to the top. That's gonna cancel the minus one over beta. And so I'm gonna get something like plus one over beta log Q of Z, right? And I can write this again as sum over Z of Q of Z, L, X, Y, Z, plus sum over Z, one over beta, um, Q of Z, log Q of Z. Okay? This is the uh, average loss, energy, whatever it is, let's call it energy. And this is the, uh, this is one over, this is minus one over beta times the entropy uh, 
of Q. Okay, the entropy of a distribution is minus sum over the random variable of distribution log distribution. Okay, so this is minus one over beta E entropy. So what does that mean? What that means is that I have an upper bound on my, the, the loss function that I want to minimize, L of x, y, okay? For my energy that I want to minimize, whatever it is, whatever function it is that I want to minimize, I have an upper bound on it now. And this upper bound is, is the sum of two terms. One is the average of the energy I get by basically sampling the latent variable, okay? So I have a system with a latent variable. I sample some uh, value of the latent variable according to some distribution Q, which of course I pick a Q from which I can easily sample. Okay, I can choose Q whatever I want, whatever I want, right? Um, so I pick a Q, uh, Gaussian, whatever, uh, and I, I pick a Z according to that distribution and I compute the expected value of the function I want to minimize with respect to uh, to that Q, and I can do this by just sampling Z from the, the Q distribution and then computing the average of the function L that I obtain as a result. Okay, so that's the first term. And then the second term uh, is the entropy of Z. So uh, what I need to do is basically change my distribution Z in such a way that uh, the entropy is maximized. So if it's a Gaussian, for example, it means I need to make the variance of Z as large as possible. But if I make it too large, then the average energy term is gonna blow up. So I need to optimize this overall, this, this, this whole function. And if I optimize this whole function with respect to Q and with respect to whatever parameter of L I want to minimize, uh, because L is an objective function with respect to, I don't know, weights of a neural net or something, right? Um, so I can simultaneously minimize with respect to those parameters W, which I didn't write here, and with respect to the Q uh, distribution. And if the Q distribution is in a family that's wide enough, uh, then this upper bound will be fairly close to the actual loss that I want to uh, minimize, which is the marginalized loss over the, uh, over the latent variable. But I never need to actually compute explicitly the marginalization over the latent variable. So this is a way of marginalizing over a latent variable without actually doing it, okay? By marginalizing over a latent variable that you can sample from like a Gaussian, but what you have to do is maximize its entropy. And when you think about variational autoencoders, that's just what they do, okay? They minimize the expected reconstruction error, which is L of X, Y, Z, with respect to the parameters by sampling the latent variable Z according to a Gaussian distribution, okay? But at the same time, there is what's called a KL term, which is the second term, that basically tries to make the distribution as high entropy as possible. Now, this formula is exactly identical to a formula that uh, people use in, uh, in uh, statistical physics. Um, so physicists have a very famous formula. Uh, uh, which is this. It says uh, the free energy is equal to the average energy minus the temperature times the entropy. Okay. Uh, what they call the temperature is what I call one over beta. Okay. And that's identical to this formula because here this is the minus entropy. Okay, this is the same formula. So what we're minimizing now is a, is a, is a free energy. And if Q of Z is sufficiently uh, powerful to actually be the actual distribution that it needs to be, uh, uh, then the inequality becomes an equality. But, um, but that's the idea of uh, variational uh, methods. You basically use Jensen's inequality to turn the log of, a, of, a, of an average into the average of the log, okay? And now you get an upper bound, right? So it's uh, this step right here, when I turn the equality uh, that was here into an inequality by applying Jensen's inequality, what I did is that I put the log inside. There was a log outside and I put it inside. So now it's the expectation of a log instead of a log of an expectation, okay? Uh, and then uh, because this is a ratio, it's a difference of two logs. And because this is uh, exponential of an energy and I take the log and I divide by beta, I get this kind of nice formula. 
And now this is called a variational free energy, okay? And you get the expected value of the energy minus uh, the inverse temperature times the entropy of the distribution. Now, how you minimize this, you know, is another story, but what that means now is that you can use a surrogate distribution to sample from your, to sample your latent variable from. You don't have to sample from the real distribution when, which, uh, you know, here the, the real distribution of Z is really complicated. I should have written it. The real distribution of Z, P of Z, uh, is uh, E to the minus beta. This actually would be a different beta. It doesn't have to be the same. Uh, e of X, Y, Z divided by the integral over z of e to the minus beta prime of e of x, y, z. That's the real, if you plug this p into, um, into here, uh, the, the equality here, the inequality here becomes an equality, okay? You can show that, uh, the, the smallest value for this variable is when Q equals P, okay? And then uh, the two terms in the inequality are equal. Okay, so that's kind of the uh, sort of energy view, if you want, of variational inference. If you need to compute the log of a sum of exponentials, replace it by uh, the average of your function plus uh, entropy term. And that will give you an upper bound. You minimize the upper bound. And because you push, down on the, you push down on the upper bound, you also push down on the function you actually want to minimize. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> it's like, you know, the bare bones kind of simplest formulation of variational inference, okay, in terms of energy. Uh, I mean, you, you can replace L by P and with some normalized stuff, right? But it, it, doesn't, it makes it more complicated. It, I mean, it doesn't make any difference really, but it makes it harder to interpret. Okay, uh, I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, a lot. So whoever stuck around for this sort of extracurricular session of more than half an hour. Yeah, 40 people. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure teaching this class, uh, particularly given the circumstances. All right. See you tomorrow, guys, and stay safe. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.